Good morning again, church. Everybody loosened up, feeling good about everything, blood flowing, feeling positive, and feeling great about life. Amen? Good. We like victories. We like to celebrate victories. We celebrate them in all kinds of ways. We have a tendency to forget, though, what it takes to gain the victory oftentimes, don't we? I remember watching this incredible uh, uh, television series. It was a docudrama. It wasn't long ago. And we saw how uh, all of this incredible epic struggle went out over World War II in lots of different theaters. And there were folks back home who were hearing about it through the newsprint and through the radio. And so they would get stories and you'd hear about such victories. And it seemed like the world just ignited with celebration. Victory in Europe, you can see it. Germany surrenders. Victory was thought to bring peace. Peace at last. It's over. But there was still another theater that was still engaged. It was the Pacific Theater. The victory was hard fought, hard won. Victory in Japan, VJ Day. And it was thought then to bring peace. And peace, it swept over into the, the pages. Peace at last. And it was thought that World War I, the World War I, the war of all worlds, would be over, but in just a few short years we were into World War II, and after the end of World War II, if you know your history, it wasn't long, and we were in yet another war, Korea, and shortly thereafter, not even a full generation, we're in Vietnam. It wasn't long ago, not long ago at all, we had folks rolling in Desert Storm, then Iraq, and now Afghanistan. It seems, it seems as though peace at last isn't peace at last. That's different. You see, VE Day stands for victory in Europe. VJ stands for victory in Japan. It finally happened. And the celebrations that sprang forth from this and across the world were tremendous. Thousands upon thousands of people filled city streets and they celebrated the end of the war. Finally, peace. celebrations I see today it's interesting to me I see people celebrating victories in sporting events they celebrate victories over board games and card games and track bets and lottery wins and political elections it seems people will celebrate victories almost over anything and everything and to show their exuberance and their happiness for that desired outcome and they do it in all manner of ways why? Because we like to see the achievement of victory. What's interesting to me though is, is while someone will cheer on their favorite football team, I don't remember any of them being out there during the practices or the plays. They didn't pay the price. We like the victories. But we seldom want to do what it takes to gain one. But that wasn't the way it was for VE or VJ Day. 
You see, it was a totally different kind of mindset because both of these theaters drew so many people into like we see now. So many people seeing and hearing about it. And some of you have children and or relatives who heard about this incredible conflict that was going on and were spurred to action by the events of 9-11. And because of that, they decided, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. I'm not just going to cheer from the balcony. I'm not just going to watch it from the easy chair. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get involved because if there's going to be a victory, then it's got to be a victory won by all of us. That's what happened during World War II. The greatest generation. They poured themselves out in the coal mines and steel mills and in the factories so that they could produce a product that would go and fight in the deserts and the valleys and the trees in the wastelands, and in the islands, and in the oceans, and in the air. These victories were won because so many people did everything they could do to gain a victory. Amen? You've heard it said, all you sun, sun you all. That's still happening. We have family here right now. Right now. The two of your sons are punishment. Three of your sons serve. I want to tell you that you can appreciate victory from the far. You can't truly appreciate the victory unless you help gain it. But there's one victory today I want to tell you about that neither you nor I nor anyone in this room did anything to achieve. And it is the greatest victory of all. But it is one that we can make an investment in and take a part of because he chose to do so. How do we best celebrate this great victory of all victories? The victory that Jesus Christ has won for us through his sinless life, his sacrificial atoning death on the cross, his resurrection, proving his victory over sin, death, and hell. How do we best celebrate the victor, Jesus Christ? Well, I think we have an answer straight from Scripture. Why don't you stand with me, please, as we... We come to God's word together. <clears throat> Romans 8, perhaps one of the most courageous and inspirational texts in all of Scripture. Read with me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
He who raised, uh, raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. For in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, 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 amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We lift up your praise and your honor. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this word of encouragement. We pray that you would open our eyes that we might see that you are the victor. Open our ears that we might hear the shout that you are Savior, you are Lord, you are God, and you reign supremely. Open our minds that we might understand this truth and our hearts that we might be receptive to it, that we might leave this place, Lord, no longer victims, but victors over all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is an incredible passage of Scripture. It is truly amazing. It points us 
to some powerful truths that we have such a tendency to overlook. When we read this, this book, we read through all the different things that Paul talks about. It's Christian doctrine and it lays out for us what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, what the struggles are with the flesh, what it means to live by the flesh, and what it means to live by the, the Spirit, and how to walk in accordance with God's Spirit, and how to live victoriously over sin, death, and hell. But we read this almost as though it's some kind of story and nothing more. Just a tale that lasts, that loses its poignancy and at last finds its place at somewhere along the Romans road that we might remember. But here's a very powerful truth we cannot, must not overlook. He is the victor and he makes us victors as well. First, verse 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. What he did now spills over onto what we are. Amen. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Then start living like it. Amen. Amen. Nobody, nobody at the end of VE or VJ Day said, Wow, that's really great news. I'm so glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, now I know. You're a different person now. I'm going to tell you that. Look what spills forth out of a grateful heart. He's a prideful heart. <laughs> On bended knee, bowed head. God, thank you. What do we do with songs? We do with shouts, praise, hallelujah. Or as they say to us, bless God, hallelujah. to you and is yours in Christ Jesus. Do you get that? There's a tendency for all too many of us to take it as an intellectual understanding. To accept it as some part of that life of gratitude and appreciation. But then it becomes a disconnect. What we think what we know doesn't spill out into our lives. Are you kidding? You see, if you are a victor, you think like a victor, you believe like a victor, you talk like a victor. I know my beginning lives. I know. He goes again. I know he is supreme over all things and sovereignty and control. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter what I think, what I feel. It doesn't matter what my circumstances are. It doesn't matter what somebody else has said or done. What matters is, is that he's in control and he said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He said the victory has been won. It is finished. It's over. The battle has been won. You. That's a big deal. Because if you're living like I live, you have a tendency to want to step up and say, okay, I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation. And about the time the words are out of your mouth, you let the flesh of the world and the Savior come right back at you. You know, you're not that big of a way. Remember that time you did that? Remember how that time you said that? Mm-hmm. You got to let that stuff go and say, that's going to cut you by the blood. That's part of it. in Christ Jesus. He's the victor and he makes us victors as well. In God's eyes and in Christ we have not sinned. That victory is paid for. 
We are righteous and holy in God's eyes. That's part of the already but not yet that Paul's writing about in Scripture. That we are now in this incredible experience. That while we are here and in this flesh and living in a fallen world and in the existence of sin around us everywhere, God sees us as He saw His Son, righteous and holy, spotless, sinless, already perfected in Christ. That's an amazing thing. In God's eyes and in Christ, you were never created to live depressed, defeated, guilty, condemned, ashamed, or unworthy. You were created to be victorious. You are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Amen? Amen. So all, all of that old stuff, all of those old memories, all of those old things you said, thought, and done, all of that has been covered by the blood of the Lamb. All of that is here. And you are here. You are a conqueror, victor in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul expresses in just a few verses before this an amazing confession of his spiritual struggle with sin. Listen to what he says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work, he writes, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks, listen, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Feel free to say, woohoo! You see, that's the struggle we all have. We get up every day, and sometimes before our feet hit the carpet and we begin our day, sin is right there. Paul is saying, that's the same experience I have. This is not a pre-converted soul. This is not a, a Paul reflecting back on old sinful days. This is Paul the Apostle, the one who wrote three quarters of the New Testament, who is dealing with a sinful struggle in his flesh on an everyday basis. And he says, it's right there. It's right there. But he delivered me. He did. Therefore, there is no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the, that's the story for each and every one of us. We read in a Paul's letter to the Romans. I also said, he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. He won the victory. Not me. He did. But because of what he did. I inherit and enjoy and, in, and, and are part of the victory. Apart from the redemptive work of God on our behalf, we had no hope at all. Now right here is where theology gets a little confusing for some folks. Because right there, we have a tendency to really believe, well, you know, if, 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 we, if we got part of the victory, then we must have, we must have to do something to do with it, with it. Maybe there's something we need to do. We need to have to dress a certain way. Maybe we learn how to talk a certain way. Or maybe we learn how to do certain things in certain ways at certain churches and certain things. So, so we do all these things and, and then, then, then we can say, wow, I, 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 I helped them in the victory. I don't want to reach that far. <laughs> but I don't mean anything about that in God's Word, do you? In fact, Ephesians 2 tells us 
It is by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen? And not of anything that you have done. Let's any man who boasts. Amen? No, we didn't do anything there this week. Not a thing. Do you know what our part is? To accept. To come to Christ and say, you won the victory. I'm a prisoner of war. I've been taken hostage by sin. And I hear you calling me. Come rescue me. right here that he's the agent of the change we have. The solution lies in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is Christ's work and that of the Holy Spirit that changes us and moves us from prisoners of war, enemies of God to victors with Christ. Someone said if we truly understood who we are in Jesus and what he has done for us as Christians, we would be the most confident people on the earth. Nothing could stop us. Why? Because he is with us and he is for us. Amen. As believers, we're no longer at war with God. We now have peace, a peace that truly lasts with God. Number two, he inherited all glory and he makes us co-heirs in his glory. In verse 14, we see, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Christ Jesus, our Lord, suffered under the constraints of the flesh, the world and the devil. And we must do likewise. He humbled himself to become a man. To live as we live. To endure as we endure. He had the same constraints that we do. Hunger, thirst, loss, hardship, suffering. All of us. And yet he said, in this life you'll have many troubles. But don't worry, I've overcome the world. That's what he told us. He added that we can have peace in him, not to worry, not to find ourselves despairing, for his overcoming of the world would be everlasting. God called us as believers to salvation, to sanctification, to service, to sacrifice, and also suffering. We are to live as Christ lived. You cannot enjoy the part of glory if you do not partake in suffering. Amen? It's an interesting thing about people. They want 
They want all of the best, but they rarely want to pay the price. The sign and seal of being God's children is new obedience in which God has experienced as one's father. The Spirit witnesses that we are God's children cannot be separated from obedience to the Father. Those who are children are also heirs, but this inheritance is conditioned upon obedience, upon the willingness to suffer. As believers, we're called to be like Christ. We have to come to the place where we don't ignore or avoid suffering, but rather appreciate it when He brings it into our lives. It's part of God's plan and His purpose for our lives. We have to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross, Paul writes in Philippians 2. Suffering then isn't something to be avoided at all costs, rather it's something to be embraced. Nobody, nobody will volunteer for suffering. The truth of it is this, my friends. Suffering is God's end. Suffering is God's refining fire. Suffering is to have Him work off all of those things that we don't need so that we can become that which He desires us to be. I shared recently a story with a friend of mine who went through a very, very painful time in his life. And he came to me and he said, you know, I've been thinking about this and I've been praying about this for, for several weeks now. And I decided, I decided last night at about 3 o'clock in the morning to wrestle with the power of this issue. I said, God, do not remove this from me. Do not take me away. Do not take me through it quickly. But rather, Rather, Lord Jesus, keep me in it as long as you desire so that you can use it to forge in me a new character, wisdom, strength, and love. Not going away. He's not only my good friend. He comes to me from pastoral counseling. And I told him, I said, wow. In all my years of ministry, I have never heard anybody say, keep me in it, Lord. Never heard anybody. Usually the response is, pray that God will solve this, fix this, get me out of this as quick as possible. Because our tendency is to get out of it. Anything that's painful, anything that's hard, anything that, that tests us and tries us, we want to get out of it as quick as we can. My friends, if we don't get to the place where we acquiesce to God's will, in God's spirit, we know we're saying, I'm doing this to make you even stronger, even better, even wiser, even more usable. Oh, I remember Max that came to work years ago. He talked about being a tool, God's toolbox. There are lots of different tools. God has a special go to tool he used all the time. us co-heirs in that glory but it's conditioned upon obedience and a willingness to suffer we tend to think that if God really loves us he'll spare us from such times of trial and trouble and testing but that's not so God loves us he disciplines us and he uses these times of trial and trouble and testing 
to refine us. Charles Spurgeon once said, men will never become great in theology until they become great in suffering. I don't want to suffer any more than you do. But I can't imagine, I can't imagine living my life not being available and being used to God. So even so, Lord Jesus, make it so. There's much more to say. I do not have time. We'll pick this up again next week. I want to say with you that as we move through this scripture, we're going to find inspiration and encouragement. We're going to find hope. But we're also going to find challenge. Stand with me as we invite the worship team to come back up.